Um, we've got a great meeting uh, lined up for you. Um, we had, of course, um, you know, our, uh, our big event this past weekend and uh, everything just went beautifully as far as I could tell. Um, the, the kickoff meeting on Friday for those of you who attended was very inspiring. Um, we had just a great turnout for all the activities on Saturday. Um, the fundraiser was a lot of fun and we met our fundraising goal um, Saturday evening. So we have a lot to celebrate um, later in the meeting. Um, and we're also later in the meeting going to um, have a Lester Woodall Society presentation. I always love those. Um, we've got an announcement of an upcoming social and, and a lot more. Um, but uh, today we are um, doing things just a little bit differently than usual. Um, we are going to start with the main course and then kind of move on to our appetizers afterwards. Uh, appetizers and dessert will come after the main course today because our speaker, Dr. Linda Butler, um, she is the VP of Medical Affairs and the Chief Medical Officer uh, for Rex Hospital, UNC Rex. Uh, she can only be with us today until one. So we want to make the absolute most of our time uh, with her because she has a, a very interesting and informative presentation. Um, so I'm going to turn this program over right now uh, to Richard Watkins for the invocation and the pledge. Uh, immediately afterwards, um, Richard is going to uh, introduce Dr. Butler. We're going to let her talk. And then afterwards, we will have our uh, announcements and our, uh, you know, at least our initial celebration uh, of um, this past weekend. So Richard, uh, it's all yours. Uh, thank you very much, President Eric. And I think it's a... a appropriate segue to go into my words and remarks for today. It's going to be a little bit different because I come at you today with a, a very heavy heart and that American flag blowing so beautifully in the air um, is going to start us off uh, today. It happens to be the case that there is an American flag um, at the center drop-off point of Durham Academy uh, where my daughter goes to school. And I drop her off and almost every day, it seems the flag, which here is shown flying as high as it can in the sky is at half mass. And it's at half mass so much that my daughter just thinks that is how it's supposed to fly. And I think that is a very sad realization that as my daughter has started school this year, she has seen our nation's flag flying at half mass more than she has seen it flying at full mass. And that is really, really painful. In fact, flags across America are probably flying at half mass today as we are on the heels of yet another mass shooting. And I know that it may seem as though these mass shootings are remote and they may not affect you. But I was just watching a reporter go through the locations of mass shootings over the past decade. And if you've ever visited any of these places ever in your life, then you realize that these situations could have easily happened to you or the ones you love. Just bear with me for a moment as I mention some of these locations, a church, an elementary school, a restaurant, a military base, a Navy yard, post office, a movie theater, a synagogue, a grocery store, a concert, college, a nightclub, a bar, a Walmart, FedEx, a McDonald's, a hospital, a community center, a city center, a municipal center, someone's home, a massage parlor, a gas station, a festival, a hotel, an airport. 
please. Let's take a moment of silence. for allowing this to happen to our country. May God have mercy on us all. If you would please stand and join me now for our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountain majesty above the fronted plain. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Thank you very much, Sutherland. And although my words were heavy and times seemed grim, there are individuals who are on the front line who wake up every single day to make this world a better place. And today's guest, today's speaker, is one of those individuals. Dr. Linda Butler is the Vice President of Medical Affairs and Chief Medical Officer at UNC Rex Healthcare in Raleigh. Linda became the first Chief Medical Officer for UNC Rex in 2009 and is currently responsible for quality and performance improvement, infection prevention, risk management, case management, and medical staff affairs. She also served as the chief medical information officer during their EPIC electronic medical record implementation in 2014. Prior to her employment at the UNC Healthcare System, Linda was a managing partner with Capital Pediatric and Adolescent Center in Raleigh for over 13 years. During that time, she served on multiple hospital committees, became the chair of pediatrics at Duke Raleigh and later Rex, and was elected president of the medical staff at Rex. Linda is a past member of the John Rex Endowment and served as the chairman. The endowment has distributed over $40 million in grant funding over the past decade to organizations who serve vulnerable youth in Wake County. She also serves on the Johnson Health Board and is a member of their quality committee. Linda currently serves on the NCSU Engineering Foundation Directors, Board of Directors. Without further ado, please give a warm virtual round of applause and greetings for our guest, Dr. Linda Butler. Thank you so much for that uh, kind introduction and for allowing me to come speak with you today. Um, I do have to say that it's my opportunity to give back uh, a little bit um, to the Rotary Club because when I was a rising senior at Millbrook High School, uh, I was a Rotary intern and I had the opportunity to work at Research Triangle Institute over the summer. Um, I did not even have any uh, inclination that I would ever go into medicine at that point, but um, in a small way that uh, did help shape my career path. So thank you for that opportunity. Um, I'm sure it was at a time when none of you were um, Rotary Club members because it was many decades ago. So with that, we'll go ahead and go into to my next slide. I just wanted to share with you sort of the timeline of what the past year has been for uh, healthcare providers in the hospital. Um, the same timeline probably can apply to Duke and it can apply to, to Wake Med as well. 
uh, we started meeting um, with the uh, Department of Health and Human Services leadership virtually uh, uh, in February. We kind of knew this, this was coming. We did not know how widespread the pandemic would be, but we did start our preparations. Then in March, we did the bulk of the work with some facility construction, other, another planning that we will go over um, in, in subsequent slides. And then we really focused on testing and, and mask policy in, in April. In, in April and May, we um, had limited elective procedures because we were trying to prepare to not have some of the same scenarios that we did uh, in, in New York where there was a big influx of, of patients. Um, we had more testing available to us in June. And then we kind of got into the swing of things uh, in, over the summer. In August, there was one thing that the CDC had, had uh, done that helped impact how we could manage patients at the hospital. At that point, um, it was learned that after 21 days, you were no longer infectious if you, were, um, if you had COVID. And we had been testing people and, and some people were kept out of work for long periods of time because we just didn't know that the PCR testing could be positive up to three months out. Uh, the CDC didn't know this either and, and uh, we were learning more about this illness as, as we progressed along in the pandemic. We kind of stayed steady over, over the fall. And in December, we were all so excited because the vaccines were available. We received vaccine, I think it was a Thursday morning and by Thursday afternoon, we were administering it to coworkers. Um, we continue to do that um, you know, and continue to this day, still vaccinating coworkers and the medical community. January and February was when we had sort of our hardest peak here at, at Rex and uh, we had to change how we did business uh, but we also had another um, hopeful thing happen. We were able to start providing monoclonal antibodies to patients. And this is an infusion that you can give um, if you have COVID and you're early enough in your illness. It's kind of like, like Tamiflu is for the flu. You can um, do this infusion. And we kept many people out of the hospital um, thanks to, to those, those drugs. Um, actually, my neighbors who are both in their 80s uh, they ended up getting COVID and uh, referred them to the clinic and they both got their infusion and they both uh, did not need to be hospitalized and are doing well to this day. Uh, and then March and, and April, uh, we're still in April, uh, only halfway through the month. Uh, we are trying to kind of get back to business as usual. Um, we're gonna try and loosen visitor restrictions and maybe back off on, on some testing. Next slide. So in this slide, you're, you're seeing construction that happened um, a little over a year ago. Within the hospital, we um, were able to create one of our zones in our ED, a complete negative pressure area where we would see all of the potential COVID patients. We um, had an ICU that had been emptied when we built our heart tower, and that was turned the entire unit as a special respiratory isolation unit under negative pressure. Uh, to, to protect our staff. And then our neurosurgery ICU was converted uh, into another COVID unit where the rooms were negative pressure. Many hospitals in, in Wake County had tents at that time outside that would help with um, segregation and, and social distancing within our EDs because most of our waiting rooms were, were very small. So the tents were used as triage we bought um, a lot of HEPA filters to place in, in areas to help with air circulation. And then many hospitals have UV lights. You can see that in the bottom of the slide. And we use those in rooms where um, patients might have Clostridium difficile or um, other bacterial illnesses, but also um, viruses like COVID. When that patient is discharged, the UV light is brought in to sterilize everything that's in that room. And then our EVS staff goes in and, and does an additional cleaning. Uh, next slide. Aside from just getting our facility ready for the COVID patients, uh, we had a huge focus on personal protective equipment. Uh, we knew that there was a shortage of that both on the West and East Coast um, when uh, they had the big influx of patients 
So we, we already had some Max Air devices, which is what's in the, the middle picture. Uh, and we purchased many more of those. We wanted to make sure we had enough of the N95 and face shield, which you can see on, on the bottom right. And then on the left, um, that is a, a different type of, of respirator that, that Honeywell makes. Uh, our, our system spent a lot of time making sure that we could get all of that equipment. And we also looked at stewardship. So we are used to kind of being a disposable society. You would use your mask and you would throw it away. At one point, those of us that were not at the bedside, we would wear uh, a mask for a week at a time to make sure that we had enough masks for our bedside caregivers. And then as we were able to purchase more, we ended up going to a mask a day. The Max Air face shields um, were reused. They could be wiped down. That way we could get three or four days or even sometimes a week out of a shield. And then NC State partnered with us to produce more of these shields. Uh, we also took the N95 masks and um, they went underwent a hydrogen steam uh, sterilization over at the medical center. And they are right now being stored in the event that we have uh, another pandemic that comes in and then we can reuse those. Thankfully with um, all of the donations that we had and uh, what our supply chain was able to procure, we uh, didn't have to go that route, but they're there in case we, we need them. At this point, we also had to limit visitation uh, because we were worried Number one, what could visitors bring into the organization? But number two, they would need a mask. They would need the gowns. They would need all the equipment that our staff were worried that was going to be a shortage. So anybody who is in isolation, they were not allowed to have visitors. We would do FaceTime, um, talk on the phone, things like that. But it was a way that we could make sure that we could protect the patients who were here in the hospital as well as our staff. Next slide. The testing, um, testing was a little bit of a challenge for us. Uh, at first, the CDC uh, was the only place where you could actually test for coronavirus and it took a week. So you can imagine being admitted to the hospital and then it takes a week for you to find out if you actually had COVID or not. Uh, thankfully, then our state lab, which is in the center, was able to run the test and, and that was you know a, a two or two to four day turnaround time. So not as bad as a week, but definitely not ideal. Then Dr. Melissa Miller, she's in the upper left of the slide, uh, her team developed a um, PCR test that was at UNC. And she was able to turn it around in, in 12 hours um, or so. Uh, when they weren't running night shift, it was up to 24 hours but that really was a kind of a game changer for us. And then we had uh, the Hologic Panther um, machine, which you can see with the Panther on it in the bottom right, uh, when they started developing a reagent and, and test kits for us, we could then now start testing for coronavirus in-house. And that lab machine has a four to six hour turnaround time. And then the Cepheid cartridge on the left, we can do a quick 45 minute um, as COVID test if we needed it uh, as patients come in. We made it our mission to be able to test every single patient who comes in to the hospital for a procedure or um, is admitted overnight. And we really had to be careful how we use these because there's a very limited supply. We only get the Cepheid shipped once a week and we get about 150 of those. And then the Panther um, uh, reagent, we had bigger shipments of it, but we were still trying to be very judicious on who got which type of test. Next slide. So we were fortunate that our um, enterprise analytics data sciences group spent a lot of time getting us kind of cool predictive models and dashboards so we could prepare. On this slide, you can see the, the three purple lines. The top line is the upper confidence interval. The middle purple line is kind of where they predicted we would be. And then the bottom is one standard deviation below. And this allowed us to kind of see what was coming our way. So we prepared for a surge of 130 patients in January. 
thankfully the blue line was where we were. So when we um, were at our peak, we had 93 COVID patients in house. So that was about 25% of our patients were COVID patients. Um, and this model was done based on um, you know, holidays impacted transmission, whatever the R naught was, how infectious the different strains are, like the UK strain seems to spread a little faster than the original strain. All of that data is put into these models and then it kind of helps you predict. So you can see that by the middle of May, we should hopefully have 10 or fewer uh, COVID patients in house. Um, right now, today, we have um, 16 COVID patients in the house. Five of them are in our ICU, 11 are on a regular acute care floor. Um, next slide. Yeah, we have this COVID dashboard. So I, I did this last week when I uh, did the presentation. So you can see that we've had about 1,700 COVID patients in the house total. Uh, last week we had 18 um, that were in house. And then we have um, on the left hand slide of the slide, you can see the previous positive count that was four. And what that previous positive means, those are people who are who have been here more than 21 days. So we are still treating them for COVID. They're still very sick, but they're no longer infectious or contagious to our staff. So we can move them out of one of the COVID units and into a regular ICU. Our average length of stay for most patients is about four, four and a half days. But um, with COVID patients, it's more like eight and a half to nine days. And at the bottom right of the slide, you can see that we had 39 patients who spent more than 40 days in the hospital. Um, these patients are really, really sick and they require a lot of resources. Next slide. Um, this is actually our, our demographic slide that we did not really have access to this type of data before. And our analytics team really has worked hard to make sure that we're tracking outcomes uh, based on not just people's age or gender, but also their race. Overall, um, we have had about 160 patients die at Rex with COVID. Um, our mortality index, which is what we uh, or observed mortalities over our expected is 0.84. So that means less people passed away than what you would have predicted based on how sick they were, which was good, but still 160 is a large number and our staff are, are traumatized every time they have to witness somebody passing away with this. And they're, they're very fatigued because our staff has, has had to work quite a bit of overtime to keep up with these volumes as well. Next slide. This is um, our vaccination slide. So the UNC Healthcare System has 14 uh, different sites across the state, um, going from Hendersonville in the west to um, Onslow in the east. We vaccinated about 150,000 people now um, and continuing to, to do more. Um, if you go to the next slide, you can see demographics. Um, and we're really trying to do some of the same outreach that you're doing. We have the Cover NC program where we have a mobile um, uh, van that can go out and we can meet people in the community and make sure we're trying to get to um, the Latinx population and the African-American population out in there. We have both Pfizer and Moderna vaccine. Um, we were using J and J prior to there um, being the pause as the CDC investigates more. Um, the, the challenge with the J and J vaccine uh, was that they found six individuals who had blood clots. But when you look at the number of people who we vaccinated, it was close to seven million. Um, it really was a, a very, very um, rare um, complication that you saw, and it would be clot, blood clots in either lungs, uh, your leg, or um, there was a, um, one that was a cerebral uh, venous um, thrombosis. And the challenge with this is if a doctor were to treat blood clots ordinarily, you give heparin, and that would be um, detrimental in this particular reaction, which is more autoimmune mediated, you treat it with different drugs. So the CDC pause 
was really more to educate all of the providers in the emergency departments to know that if somebody had gotten J&J vaccine uh, about one to three weeks out, if they come complaining about a headache, shortness of breath, um, pain in their legs or in their abdomen, that they might have this particular type of blood clot and not to give heparin uh, to do immunoglobulin or another treatment course. Um, but overall, I would much rather take my chances of being the one in a million or more that might have a problem than be somebody who gets COVID because even if you're relatively young or healthy or you don't have any comorbidities, we still have seen people pass away um, with COVID. So I think the vaccine is a much safer bet. If you go to the next slide. Um, I just wanted to reassure you that while we were taking care of COVID patients, we were taking care of all of our other patients as well. And we um, you know, had business as usual and we were able to go ahead and, and get uh, some of these other uh, awards and accolades. We got our fourth magnet designation. Uh, we were reaccredited by the Joint Commission. Um, we were um, five star for CMS for quality, not only in our hospital, but in our two school nursing facilities. Um, and I think next week we'll uh, have the, the um, um, press release that we got another LeapFrog A, where I think one of 27 hospitals who are LeapFrog A and CMS five star and magnet accredited across the country. And that's of over 5,000 hospitals. We got the um, Watson top 50 cardiovascular hospitals and we were the best hospital in North Carolina according to um, Business Magazine. Next slide. Um, we're also continuing to expand and grow. This is a picture of uh, UNC Rex Holly Springs, which will open September of this year. And I didn't include a picture of our cancer center. It's not as far along in construction, but it's right across the street from Rex and that will open up at the end of December. So we're continuing to grow to meet the needs of Wake and surrounding counties. Um, and next slide. I do want to thank the community for a lot of the um, outreach and donations that they've uh, done for us. Uh, we got lots of supplies at the beginning of the pandemic and we continue to get care packages um, from you know, just community citizens as well as businesses. Uh, Burt's Bees uh, donated a lot of um, their products to us. And you know, who doesn't love Krispy Kreme? Um, don't eat too much of it or you'll end up in our heart hospital but we've got to have a donut every now and then. And then Coyote donated um, masks as well as uh, one of their vehicles, which really excited our protective services group to have um, a brand new vehicle in there. But we thank everybody for their support and their well wishes and meant a lot to our staff. And I think that's kind of where I, I'm going to end so that you guys can ask me any questions. Uh, Dr. Butler, absolutely fantastic presentation. And also, I saw a mention in the chat uh, that you're also a, a nuclear engineer. And so we're also very excited to be talking to you today and all of your accomplishments. I really appreciate it. I had a question regarding uh, some of the mortality data that you showed on there. And forgive me if I misinterpreted, I tried to take a, a mental snapshot. Um, but the mortality rate for whites was higher than I expected it to be. Tell me a little bit about why that number was, was, was particularly high. I don't think they were the highest group. I think the mortality rate for Native Americans was the highest, but uh, for white Americans, that actually caught me off guard. Could you talk about that? Yeah, um, it, it depends on which area you're, you're looking in the country as to the mortality rates. I think what, um, what we see here is age was probably the greatest predictor of your mortality. And uh, we had a lot of residents at skilled nursing facilities initially that ended up coming into the hospital. And we had um, kind of sad stories of moms and, and their, their siblings with mom being 90 and, and, and the, the children being in their 60s passing away. Um, and as we learn more through the pandemic, we were able to um, treat people more efficiently and, and uh, we had more drugs at our disposal as well. 
So um, it was really more a, a breakdown of age, whether they were diabetic, what their BMI was. Um, and it, it is surprising because the media really did play up to um, the Latino and African-American population being disproportionately affected. And they, they really were in, in many areas. That was not necessarily what we saw in our data, but we're just a small subset of a much larger picture. Um, for us, the Native American um, number looked larger because we had only a few, um, a few patients. So, um, you know, we're continuing to learn about this illness as it goes along, uh, but really age is, is what really puts you at most risk, and it's why the um, Department of Health and Human Services started out saying with the vaccine really needs to be given to people 65 and up. Great. Do you have time for uh, two more questions? It is one o'clock. Sure. Okay, sure. so this question um, comes from President Eric Stevens. Um, have you noticed any changes or any change in the demographics and age of patients hospitalized with COVID since the vaccines have become available? Um, you know, that's a great question. I haven't looked at our specific data. I think that overall our, um, our number of patients have come down, which was great. Um, some of that is because there was such a great um, push for those who were 65 and up to get vaccinated early on. Um, also, unfortunately, a significant portion of that population did pass away. So, you, you know, they, they won't get it a second time. Um, I, I think right now we are still seeing older individuals, but not as many as there were before. And I'd have to run another report to see kind of where the averages are now. All right, so the next question uh, came to me as a direct message, so I will respect uh, the request for anonymity here. Uh, so how does 167 lost lives in one year due to COVID at the hospital compare to other diseases, heart, cancer, uh, et cetera? Um, yeah, um, this person says that they're a huge fan of Rex and both of their kids uh, were born there. At least that's at least that's what I understand. So it's a comparison of you know COVID deaths and how it relates to other deaths at Rex. Yeah, I think it's um it's tricky on on how mortality is um is reported because we do sometimes have patients who are in our our oncology program and as if they have like a a stage four illness and you know they're going to pass that sometimes it's the patient wishes that they stop treatment and they go on to comfort care. Um, I can tell you that our overall mortality index for all comers is um, closer to one. It's like 0.93, it was last that I checked. So still we, we tend to save more people than we're expected to save. Uh, but um, you know, we, we do have deaths that happen for other reasons. Uh, I can't give you an exact number again because the people who are comfort care who or who come and say that they do not resuscitate, they don't really count in our numbers. I will say we probably have more people passing away uh, of other things combined, but there's there's not been any one um, illness that has had that huge a number of, of deaths. Our leading cause of mortality is sepsis. But a lot of these COVID patients also would then have sepsis as their diagnosis, which is sort of a systemic um, response to an infection. And COVID is, is an infection. Um, a lot of these people um, who pass away, they had more than one actual illness, but COVID was then deemed as the cause of their, their death um, because that was sort of what pushed them over the edge and got them admitted. Um, you know, it has been really hard for our ICU nurses uh, because these patients do disproportionately pass away in the ICU, uh, whereas our other patients may pass away on different acute care floors if they've had you know, bad heart failure or um, if they've had um, you know, oncology, they would be on a different floor. So I can't give you a specific number. I even had to run a report to find that 160 for COVID and that was sort of my focus. So sorry. All right, thank you so much. I wanna be respectful of your time, but I have one more question. If I could, I have your email address. 
There are a few more questions in the chat. Could I direct those questions to you via email and then get those yeah. answers back to the people that asked that question? So I will do that for the questions that have been in the chat. Um, I just want to say, uh, Dr. Butler, I enjoyed this presentation so much. I learned a lot. I wish I could have that PowerPoint so I'd have an opportunity to take notes, but I thought it was fantastic. Thank you for the work you do. Thank you for the lives you save. I really appreciate your leadership. And thank you for joining us here um, with the Rotary Club of Raleigh. Well, thank you for your work on vaccination because that's truly where we're gonna make a difference is the more people we vaccinate, the more people we'll save. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. President Eric. Okay, um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Butler. Um, and uh, uh, thank you, Richard, for uh, moderating uh, that discussion. Um, you know, it's, uh, this is one of those things where it is, you know, such a, such a blessing that we are um, getting people vaccinated and moving towards, um, moving towards the end um, of this pandemic, we hope, or towards um, the end of the, the acute phase of it um, anyway. Uh, but I thought that it would be helpful for us all to have a reminder um, that, that, you know, um, we, we don't need to spike the, the ball in the end zone um, before, uh, before everything is all done. And, um, you know, uh, it struck me when I read an article uh, in the News and Observer that talked about the 160 people that had died of COVID. Um, and sometimes uh, when you hear all these numbers, um, uh, you know, it, it doesn't really strike you as real until something just kind of jumps out at you. And that was something that, that sort of jumped out at me. Um, and so uh, just, just keep in mind that, uh, you know, um, these are real human beings that, uh, that have been uh, really, really devastated by this pandemic. Um, and we need to continue uh, to be patient, continue to do our social distancing, continue to, to work to, to get vaccinated and to, to you know, talk to other people like we did this weekend um, uh, to encourage um, other people to get vaccinated so, so we can move on. All right, uh, with that uh, uh, sober uh, discussion, um, now we can move on to the fun part of our program today. Um, and so, um, I'm going to suggest, uh, first of all, that uh, you send a chat um, or an email to Linda uh, to put virtual money in the cart bucket for Alzheimer's research. Um, and want to throw out an opportunity for anybody um, who is um, interested to um, uh, share some happy dollars today. Hey, Eric, this is Mark. Um, <clears throat> as you know, about the time our day of service was starting on Saturday, our daughter decided to give birth to our third grandchild. So uh, Sylvia and I will be putting some happy dollars into the bucket. Those are very happy dollars. Congratulations. Uh, what, what is your grandchild's name? His name is Jackson Edward Royal. He well, was- uh, Jackson Edward. Yeah, nine pounds, nine ounces, so big fella, wow. and uh, 21 inches, so about my height. <laughs> um, well, that's, that's wonderful. Congratulations, uh, Mark. Those are happy dollars indeed. Um, any other happy dollars? I've got happy dollars. Okay. <clears throat> True to my daddy's footsteps, I had a birthday last week. So I will be contributing, gosh, I think it's $64. And I will top it off because my son, who's in the background here, has, uh, his name is Dash Bumgardner. He has gotten his real estate license and is joining me in my practice. So I'm very excited about that too. That's, uh, that's very exciting, and uh, thank you so much for, uh, for that generous contribution and for those happy dollars, Eddie. What else do we have for happy dollars today? Eric, I'd like to throw in a, I'll throw in a happy dollar for my hometown team. Some of y'all know I grew up in Lexington, Virginia, and my hometown team of VMI, the Virginia Military Institute, uh, delayed football but played spring football, their record is six and one. They won the Southern Conference first time since 1960, and they're playing in their first FCS playoff game 
uh, this weekend against James Madison at Harrisonburg, Virginia. So go cadets. <laughs> go cadets indeed. Uh, thank you so much, Charlie. Um, all right, um, and at this point, um, I know we have a couple of um, guests that were invited by Jim Dorsett. Jim, would you like to introduce your guests? Yes, thank you, President Eric. Well, uh, due to COVID, I had not met um, two of our newest Smith Anderson associates until uh, Saturday uh, because uh, Dewey Bennett and Philip Romer uh, volunteered to participate in the Rotary Day of Service. Uh, as you know, Smith Anderson was a sponsor and we were assigned the cleanup of Roberts Park, uh, a, a wonderful park that I was not familiar with, but uh, Dewey and Philip uh, came to the, to the event and uh, uh, Philip brought his uh, son and daughter with him and they were extremely able uh, uh, park rangers I would say uh, uh, did a did a fantastic job, and I detected that heart for service that we uh, look for in Rotary members, and so I invited them to attend our meeting to sort of check us out. And uh, so, just a little bit about them: Dewey Bennett is from Raleigh. Uh, he was an Eagle Scout. Uh, he attended UNCW, where he was a cum laude graduate. He went to UNC Law School and graduated with honors. He practiced in New York for a number of years representing banks and financial institutions. And uh, he loves snowboarding and animals. Uh, and fortunately for us, uh, he's moved to Raleigh and joined Smith Anderson uh, in our venture capital uh, financial institutions practice. And Philip Romer um, uh, grew up in Nebraska, attended University of Nebraska, uh, but he came to North Carolina for law school, went to Duke, and then he practiced in Boston and he became uh, assistant general counsel for Pacific Western Bank. Uh, Philip is a father and uh, he's very active in Y guides and sports. Um, and he's also um, with Smith Anderson in our financial institutions practice. So I'm very pleased to introduce both of them uh, to uh, the members of the club and and to introduce them to Rotary. And I hope they've enjoyed the program today with Dr. Butler. Uh, wonderful, interesting program. Great, uh, thank you so much, Jim. Uh, welcome, uh, Dewey and Philip. Uh, Philip, uh, I was a Y Guides and sports dad for, for years and years, and um, <laughs> it was an awful, awful lot of fun, but I can also tell you that you got through it. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> um, all right, guys, um, let's move on. And at this point, um, I think there was a little something that happened this weekend. So I was hoping that maybe um, we can ask um, uh, Alex to start off by talking about the fundraiser. Hey guys, um, so I just, um, quick update, I don't have final tallies, but I just wanted to say thank you again to everybody um, that came out. We had a blast um, and definitely had some um, interesting pairings with uh, the wine and the Girl Scout cookies. Um, so we had a great time. So again, just wanna say thank you to everybody. Um, I'm hoping that I'll have a final tally for you guys soon, hopefully at next week's meeting, um, but I, feel fairly confident in saying that we surpassed our $7,000 fundraising goal. So once again, thank you all and I'll have updated numbers for you soon. All right, uh, thanks a lot, Alex. That was, um, as always, a very fun time. Um, we had some great wine pairings and the Prosecco and lemonade combination was delicious. Um, all right, and now uh, we can move on to um, Gina and uh, Mark, if you want to talk uh, more generally about the day of service. Yes, hello everyone. Um, I'm sure Mark is, is pretty, pretty tired because having a new grandson, uh, that's really exciting. Congrats to you and Sylvia. Um, I know that I definitely did not have a grandson this weekend, but I am super, super tired. Um, and that's because we had an epic 
day of service. So one, before I talk about the day of service and I am pulling all the energy I can, I'm having my third cup of coffee today uh, because I would rather be taking a nap, but I want to thank our sponsors um, and our generous donations from uh, different members of our club and members in the district. So without your help, we could not have exceeded our $7,000 goal. So I do have an estimate of like 7,400. Um, we will We'll get those final numbers to you but you know truly if you think about it today or, or this past weekend was the first time the district um, did a day of service district-wide and they tasked our club with um, promoting this event and spearheading it and that in itself um, one is a great honor um, but two is, is of course you know a, a huge undertaking and then thinking about that during a pandemic um, makes it very, very difficult. So it was very kind of decentralized. Um, I went to the numbers on our sign up genius and Alex and I combined sent over close to 500 emails to volunteers just through sign up genius alone. So thinking about that type of communication um, is, is just, was a lot of work. Um, but thinking about, um, we did in-person events and donation sites, and then we had a fundraising component. So there was a lot going on and we have some great organizations that we will be donating um, the $7,000 to. But again, thank you so much to the members as well as our corporate sponsors for participating. So next slide. And just to kind of throw some organizations at you. Um, we had on Saturday over 150 volunteers district-wide um, and over 30 to 35 different or uh, part or different um, service projects going on. Um, so that is super dynamic. I, I am thrilled on the participation um, and I, I'm really, really humbled by everybody rallying together, especially in the last like three weeks. Um, I think it's because of those vaccinations, everybody started getting excited. And I'm very blessed that we had at least a beautiful day on Saturday to give back to the community. But you can just, just the slide alone shows the impact of the different um, community service partners that we um, got, got to interact with. I got an email this morning from Habitat Wake, and this is, I um, wanted to, to give you this information. She says, uh, good morning, Gina. I've gotten word from all the stores that Rotary volunteers were amazing this weekend. I hope that we didn't work them too hard. It looks like our stores made our sales goals for the week by having a great Saturday. You and your group definitely helped us get us that win. Please tell everyone uh, we enjoyed having you and look forward to other day, uh, other um, volunteer days in the future. So I have been receiving tons of emails similar to this um, from different clubs celebrating their successes as well as our community partners. Um, so be very, very proud of yourself. I want to thank uh, the club, of course, um, for, 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 for rallying together either through monetary donations, in-kind donations, and or um, sponsorships, and or participating on the day of service and or our wine tasting. And most importantly, I would like to thank all of those people who brought it together, especially Mark and Eric, who um, I was just emailing, I feel like continuously through um, every day uh, without your leadership and guidance, this definitely could not have been done. Um, I will give, I think that that's it in terms of slides that I created. I created these yesterday and I was really tired. So I don't think I have a third slide, but Valerie, do I have a third slide? <laughs> No, okay. <laughs> so Eric, I'll pass it off to you. Great, um, thank you so much, uh, Gina. Um, obviously, uh, Gina um, has done heroic work um, over the past, uh, well, um, certainly the past few months, but uh, you know, we started the planning for this uh, you know, basically back in the summer. Um, but over the past couple of months, um, it has been uh, you know, just, uh, a very consuming thing, I think, for Gina. Um, and I certainly want to thank her, thank uh, um, the people uh, that hopefully all of the cybersecurity is still staying secure at all of your hospitals, uh, Gina, while you have been focusing on this. 
Um, I'm sure you have managed to, to multitask and, and keep everybody taken care of, but um, uh, I know how much work uh, I've been able to see more behind the scenes than some other folks, uh, what, what you've done to, to make this all happen and to, you know, all, a lot of those people showing up has to do with you sending out all of those very good reminder emails um, and, uh, you know, uh, looking at some of the, the lists of people who were um, going to volunteer two weeks out, a week out, um, you know, the, the numbers weren't nearly as full as they ended up on the last day. And there was a lot of work done by you and lots of people um, to, to kind of uh, make all that happen. So um, you know, I couldn't be more proud to, to be um, a Rotarian um, this Monday. And I really do thank um, all of you and all of, everyone in the club. Um, I really thank Mark for, um, you know, all of your wisdom and guidance. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, anytime there's a decision to be made, if, I'm, if I want wise guidance uh, about the right thing to do, um, Mark is the person that I, I go to. Um, and I think half the time, um, Mark gives the right answer um, and then tells me that um, he got it from his wife. So, so maybe the, the true uh, wisdom uh, comes from Sylvia. So thanks to all of you. Um, and uh, now uh, I'd like to turn this over to Eric Larson um, to thank uh, our three newest Lester Woodall Society members. Absolutely. Thank you, President Eric. I, I feel like piling on on the Mark Hackett fan club. I've known Mark for 30 or 40 years, and he has provided wise counsel to me in a, a number of modes. And so I, I, I concur totally with those comments. And congratulations to Mark and to Gina and to Alex on, on a successful program and all the people that supported them as well. Uh, one of the things we say about Rotary is Rotary means service. And certainly service is the work of your hands that we've been talking about but also sharing of your assets. And that's where the Club Foundation and the Rotary International Foundation come into play. And today we're uh, acknowledging and recognizing two new members of the Lester Woodall Society. The Lester Woodall Society recognizes people who've made a $500 contribution or more to the Rotary Club of Raleigh Foundation. Lester Woodall, those of us who knew him uh, in person, uh, he, he went by the name of Woody Woodall. He was the first large benefactor of the Rotary Club of Raleigh Foundation and really got us started. So today we are recognizing Duncan and Harrison who have reached that, uh, that milestone and are being inducted into the Lester Woodall Society. Uh, they have received a pin backer that will go behind the Rotary pin. You can see it demonstrated on the screen there if you have two screen showing of what that looks like. And so we uh, are proud to recognize them I will tell you, you can join the Lester Woodall Society by giving incrementally, or you can give in one fell swoop or any way you want to do that. Uh, I would put a couple of thoughts into your mind. Number one, should you be receiving a tax refund this year, it would be really great to just turn that into a donation to the Rotary Club of Raleigh Foundation and pass that on. It immediately becomes a tax deduction for you for the next year. So that's one thought to put in there. The other thought is a lot of companies, when you join them, they write or they provide to you as part of your employee benefits a relatively modest life insurance policy, usually around $10,000 or something like that. Even sometimes when you join a credit union, they'll uh, give you that, that benefit. Wouldn't it be interesting to designate the Rotary Club of Raleigh Foundation as the beneficiary of that? If you do any of those things, let Linda or myself know, and we will certainly pass on the recognition if you wish it to be uh, provided. But uh, we had our meeting about the Rotary Club of Raleigh Foundation and the Rotary International Foundation with Carl a few weeks ago. And our challenge to the club was, we'd love to see half the people in the club do some sort of out of cycle contribution to those funds. So those are just a couple of creative thoughts. But back to the purpose of today, Duncan and Harrison, we are really pleased to in in induct you into the Lester Woodall Society. We thank you for your contributions. They will do amazing work around the, the city, around our region. Uh, a quick story Carrie was telling me about uh, working at the Healing Place or the Healing Transitions this weekend. And that's an organization we have decades long relationship with as far as supporting them. They are one of the most successful drug and alcohol rehabilitation centers in the country. They have an amazing track record. And Carrie was telling me some of the stories of the people there working with her 
Uh, if you don't know about the healing place, as soon as you arrive there and get your feet underneath you, you start working. You work to support that group. The goal there is to graduate you there from that program. And they have a phenomenal success rate that is the envy of most places that you would spend hundreds of thousands of dollars at to, to send a family member to. So we're, we are investing good programs around the, the city, around our region, and it's made possible by people like Duncan and Harrison, who we are recognizing today. So thank you, President Eric, and I'll pass it back to you. Thank you so much. And uh, we really do appreciate those donations. So um, Duncan, Surrey, um, Harrison, uh, we really do appreciate uh, uh, this. And uh, thank you to Eric um, and uh, the members of Eric's committee for uh, all of their good work determining the best way to put that money to, to, to use. All right, um, at this point, I'm not sure if we have a slide for this, but um, we do have a fun announcement uh, from Christy Santacana. Uh, Christy. All right. Um, yeah, sorry, I did add this on last minute, so I don't think we have a slide here, but wanted to give y'all an update on our social for this month. We are going to do it in person as the plan. So uh, I know we've been doing the virtual socials for over a year now. Our, our last in-person social was February of 2020. So um, Thursday, April 29th at 5.30 p.m., um, we're going to plan on meeting at Linwood Brewing Concern. Uh, we were there a couple of years ago as well. It's at 1053 East Whitaker Mill Road in the Loading Dock Complex. I uh, picked this place. This has a really large outdoor space um, with a big patio and then a kind of a side yard with tons of picnic tables. So I think it'll be a great spot to uh, dip our toes in the water with the in-person event and uh, it could be nice and socially distanced. Uh, they have some great beer varieties as well as wine. It's connected to Wilson's next door if you prefer cocktails. So uh, we'll have Linda send out an evite. We're going to try to get an estimated head count. I know we usually don't do that, but uh, just uh, since things are a little different now, uh, we want to know if we should um, try to reserve a couple picnic tables or something. So uh, Linda will get that sent out. And um, we hope you guys can join us if you feel comfortable meeting in person. Uh, 5.30 on April 29th. So, um, oh, and if there's any rain weather issues, then we'll keep you posted on any changes. And um, we'd love for guests to attend. So uh, Philip and Dewey and anybody else that would like to uh, come, we'll pass along that invitation too. All right, thank you so much, uh, Christy. It's been a long time since, uh, the, since we have been able to gather together and uh, drink a beer and um, have a nice social time. Uh, so, uh, so glad that um, we get to get back to that. So please uh, look for the sign up genius and let's sign up and fill up those picnic tables. Um, next, uh, I was going to ask uh, Bill McLaurin if you are interested uh, uh, in giving us a, a quick report about the Peace Fellow graduation that happened a couple of weekends ago. Um, I was gonna ask you to do that last week and we ran out of time. Well, I'd be happy to speak a little bit about that. I, I attended virtually this year, which was uh, Saturday a week ago. And it happens uh, every year. And I've been to several in person. And I gotta say that the real thing is better, but uh, they did a good job with this year. And I heard from uh, some of the students from Ethiopia, Malawi, Australia, Mexico, Canada, and Colombia. Uh, I was only able to attend about two thirds of the presentations um, as I had a conflict in the afternoon. But uh, they are all finishing a master's degree program at Duke or UNC in public health, international law, and other disciplines. And they are also taking courses together associated with the Peace Center. Um, next April, they'll, we'll have another one. It will be uh, probably at UNC, but once in a while they have them at Duke. Um, and I hope that more people will go and just take a look at uh, what we're sponsoring as Rotarians um, in our own district. Uh, but Rotarians around the world support this Peace Center at Duke and UNC. Uh, one presentation that I thought was interesting 
um, because I ha haven't heard this uh, presentation on this before, but it was about unsolicited donations when, uh, when we have a natural disaster or something somewhere in the world. A lot of people just send things, hoping that or thinking that these things might be clothes or uh, some type of, of equipment, but they'll send it without checking to see if it's needed. And the cost of unsolicited donations uh, it turns out are multi millions of dollars a year that people donate that are not used and actually become a problem for the nonprofit, just what to do with a lot of, a lot of things that are uh, totally unsolicited. So the, uh, the, the person who made this presentation encourages everyone to check with the nonprofit that you're trying to support and make sure that what you're sending is usable for them and that they won't have to find another way to get rid of something that you sent. So uh, I thought that was an interesting take on natural disasters. Anyway, uh, I hope more people will go to the Peace Center in April. And there's always opportunities every end of every summer to uh, be a counselor for one of the peace centers that's incoming. And we have 10 per year that uh, uh, come to North Carolina to join the peace center and we can interact with them. We're the only district in the United States that has a peace center. So we're very fortunate and I hope that we will take advantage of it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. Uh, and those of us who participated in the uh, kickoff meeting on Friday got to hear from one of uh, the Peace Fellows, uh, Gabriel Bernardo da Silva from Brazil. And, uh, you know, I found that to be a, a tremendously inspiring uh, presentation. Um, and you, you realize just, uh, you know, what a, um, you know, what a wonderful group of people um, they brought together there um, at, uh, you know, the Duke UNC um, Peace Center, um, basically just to train them to go out and, and, you know, in concentrated doses do what they do to make the world a better place. So, um, you know, it's a great, great um, thing that we have right here in our backyard. Um, all right. Um, next, next week, uh, we are going to have the winners of our four-way test um, contest that we, uh, we do every year with Martin Middle School. Um, so please join us back here uh, next week for that. Um, I had been hoping to have our announcement today of um, in-person lunches beginning uh, the following week, and uh, we're a little bit delayed on that, still waiting on some final quotes from uh, the City Club, but uh, that is coming soon, I promise. Um, and as soon as we get all the, uh, you know, all the final details uh, nailed down, um, we will be sending out some sign-up geniuses for, for you all to, uh, uh, to kind of get back to meeting in person um, in the City Club. And we're hoping uh, to have um, four or five um, in-person meetings before the end of this Rotary uh, year um, uh, in May and June. Um, and, then, uh, and then I'll leave it to Charles Edwards uh, uh, on the planning for next year. Um, <clears throat> we do have uh, some birthdays and anniversaries to celebrate. Uh, happy birthday to uh, our member, um, NC State Chancellor Randy Woodson. Um, April 20th uh, uh, is his birthday tomorrow. So happy birthday, Randy. Um, and happy anniversary to Lee and Cynthia Hammond. Um, I believe what I see there is that's their 64th wedding anniversary. Could that be right? Um, and happy uh, um, anniversary to um, Duncan and Ashley Jennings. Um, so I uh, hope uh, you, you guys have a, a wonderful and amazing celebration. Um, and uh, it was great to see everybody today. Thank you for joining us. We will close now with the four-way test. Thank you.
of the things we think, say, and do first. Is it, is the, it the truth? truth? Second, is it fair, is it fair to all concerned? Third, third, will it build, build goodwill? Will better, better friendships? And fourth, will it be, will it be beneficial will to all concerned? concerned? We are adjourned. R-O-T-A-R-Y. That spells rotary. Very good. Bye, everyone. Have a good day. Bye.